5. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and chapter 5. Charlie did not laugh. He's so nervous right now. So I've been harassing. He was trying to like sidle over to the camera before we sang, but I smiled at him, so he stopped. And I was just sitting there looking nervous. So Charlie, you're fun, man. You make you make people joyful. Are you there in First Corinthians four? Okay, find verse 15. It's right after 14. And it's that's 13 ahead. Or it's 13 <laughs> behind 14. For though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Wherefore I beseech you, be ye followers of me. And then, let's go down to uh, uh, verse 20 and 21. For the kingdom of God is not in word, but in power. What will ye? Shall I come unto you with a rod, or in love, and the spirit of meekness? Uh, chapter 5, verse 1. It is reported commonly that there is fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And now in verse 12, For what have I to do to judge them also that are without? Do not ye judge them that are within, but them that are without, God judgeth. Therefore, put away from among yourselves that wicked person. Now, there's a lot of information in the middle of that. But uh, we're not going to look at everything that's in the middle tonight. We're just going to look at a couple of things that I believe are pertinent uh, to our uh, context and the particular message uh, that we're going to hone in on what Paul was saying to the church at Corinth. Uh, so we'll ask the Lord to help us with our understanding now. Father, without you, it is literally true that we can do nothing. And God, sometimes we think that that's simply just the physical things that we do that we cannot do without you. And it's true we cannot breathe without you being the breath giver. We cannot work without you giving us the strength. We can not take advantage of opportunity without you providing the opportunities. But God, even more so spiritually, without you we can do nothing. And without your word we know nothing, and without the help of your spirit we don't know it with any confidence what we do know. And so I ask for those things this evening and your help. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to ask uh, some questions this evening, and I'm hoping they'll be different from some of my questions. I see some of y'all look like deer in the headlights sometimes when I begin to ask questions. You know, you think, well, what's the trick? What's the catch? And then you try to figure out what the catch is and get it right. But usually, sometimes you're trying to figure out what the catch is and you get it wrong because of that. And so I think some of y'all have just taken the tactic of just guessing the opposite, you know, or just taking the 50 percentile. If it's yes or no, just throw a no out there and throw a yes out there. You know, you've got a halfway chance. Uh, but uh, anyway, I want to give you some curveballs, or not some curveballs, some softballs this evening. Brother Frank would call them a lollipop, uh, which means it's a great big old ball that's easy to hit. So I'll give you some easy questions this evening to start off, but I really want to uh, take our thinking in a direction. So if you can imagine that I'm a, a progressive school teacher using progressive education, where instead of uh, actually giving out information, I facilitate the thought process so that you come to your own conclusions. That's what we're doing right now. So let me facilitate it just a little bit with some easy questions. First question is this. What is the most valuable asset in a church ministry? What is a church ministry's most valuable asset? People. Raise your hand. Raise your hand. Okay. Lee got it. What is it? People. People are the most valuable asset in a church member, in a church family. Uh, 
That's the right question, right answer to the question, right off. See, that was a that was a lollipop, wasn't it? Wasn't that it? Was that it? Was that ever what everybody was going to guess? <laughs> what were you going to say, Josh? I was going to say like preaching or the word of God. Okay, let's stop just a second, and we'll get the wrong answers first. If we're right. <laughs> okay, so what's the what's the wrong answer? I was going to say preaching. Okay, no. Um, <laughs> the Bible. The Bible. It's an important asset, but the, uh, the Bible doesn't belong to the church. The Bible is God's word, and and it belongs to all of us, so no. And what was you? What was it that you were going to say, Patty? Holy Spirit. Oh, we were going to get a lot of wrong answers, weren't we? Mm -hmm. I, the, the Holy Spirit isn't an asset, though. He's a person, you know. But people, <laughs> we're going to say, yeah, okay. <laughs> are an asset, right? Okay, let me explain it to you. Let me let me go along with the line of reasoning. We're going to get into our text and our context. We're going to understand something that Paul was trying to help the church at Corinth with, and we're going to see something that was a matter of personal, private concern. For Paul as well, and it's going to be helpful, so uh, hang in there if you're a little bit skeptical about this. When we started our church, one of the things that I realized we needed were people. Now, some years ago, years past, uh, right down the street from here, uh, Calvary Baptist Church of Fort Lauderdale used to be, and then later on they moved to uh, Boca and, and were named First Baptist of Hillsboro, and then they changed their name again to First Baptist of Coconut Creek because now they're in Coconut Creek meeting in Coconut Creek High School. Uh, but years ago, that church was literally in this neighborhood. Uh, and then there was a split out of that church by Dr. Don Nelson, Bethany Baptist Church. Now, the Dollins would know this because you uh, attended the church, but Don Nelson had a dispute and split the church, and some people left, and they started Bethany Baptist Church. And it would have been uh, right over in North Anders Gardens when they had, yes, right where the community center is on uh, 56th Street. And about 15 years ago, when we were preparing the thought process of starting a church in the Fort Lauderdale area, one of the things that we realized was that though there used to be independent Baptist churches in Fort Lauderdale, there no longer were. And so we thought, well, you know what? Being that Fort Lauderdale is the largest city, in Broward County uh, in that the east part of Broward County is the most populated area part of Broward County it makes sense that if there ought to be independent Baptist churches it makes sense that there should be more there not fewer or actually none as the case is there are none east of I-95 all the way down to our church in Miami Beach and all the way up to back then it was uh, Jupiter but they moved west as well so all the churches all moved west and you know, kind of took the assets from those ministries and started churches in new developed areas, but left behind the people that didn't move away and in the city area. So, Pastor McClure, my pastor, knowing we wanted to start a church, one of the things he wanted us to do was look at Fort Lauderdale. And one of the things that he mentioned was that there had been a number of church plant attempts that had closed their doors and a number of churches that had closed. And the assumption was, well, there are people that used to go to those churches who no longer have a place to go to church. And so we compiled a list of people, put together a list of people, uh, some that were going to churches where their pastor said, hey, talk to these people in our church. You know, they still live in that area, and maybe they'd be interested in going. The Dollins would have been a family uh, that Dr. Shermerhorn would have said, you know, the Dollins, you know, they live right over in, you know, East area and mentioned some other people uh, in the area. And said, you know, maybe speak to them. And uh, there were some people in that were going to our church in Delray Beach driving, you know, 20 20 miles, 30, 25 miles, yeah, the Joneses would have been, uh, would have driven down. And uh, Brother uh, Ted was a deacon in our church while he was still living. And, and so he really seriously prayed about being part of the church plant. But one of the things we saw right from the beginning was that we need people to be part of a church plant. I was a little naive back then. It never occurred to me that the reason that the churches east of I-95 had closed were because the people that were in them didn't keep them open. I always felt like a pastor's closed. But, you know, a pastor can't really close a church. Not a real church. Not a church that's a body instead of a, a, instead of a, a group that's run by a dictator. I'm talking about a, a church that practices priesthood of believers. It's a, it's a church, albeit not all, everything it should be, it's a church with or without a pastor. A church, a local body is. I ought to have a pastor. If it's without a pastor, I ought to find one. But with or without a pastor, a church is still a church. And so I learned after some time that it wasn't so much the pastors that closed the churches. It was that there weren't people 
that were burdened for there to be churches. And so a number of people that weren't going to church at all, Melissa and I, we would visit them, and they would give us a reason why they weren't going to be part of the church when we started. I always thought, man, they're going to be so excited we're starting a church. Most of them would say something like this, well, you know, I've been part of a church plant before, or I was part of a church and it closed, and it's just I just don't want to go through that, so I don't think you're going to make it. And so, you know, I'm just not interested. But so instead, they don't go anywhere. Instead of going to a church that might close or a church that's missing people. Some people say, you know, it's just so much work to start a church. It's just too much for me. It's kind of discouraging at first. But one of the things that really encouraged me at first uh, were the people that came with us to start the church. Brother Chris Callahan, who was from Maryland and had no connection to Southeast Florida, uh, except for that he'd come and and worked in our summer day camp because of a connection with me. And, uh, and uh, Joel McCrawl, the same, and Lydia McCrawl. Uh, the three of them, as single individuals, moved here not having any connection in Fort Lauderdale, the same way that Melissa and I moved here, not having lived in Fort Lauderdale before. And we moved here to start a church. And I remember people telling me, you know, it would be really good if you could start with the building. Well, that would be great if we could start with the building. They said, you know, you really, you know, you really need, if you had a half a million dollars in the bank, you know, you know, that'd be great. Love to have a half a million dollars in the bank. But let me just tell you something. I wouldn't have traded Brother Chris for a building. Just wouldn't have traded. I see churches with buildings close all the time. And they close because they don't have people, not because they don't have a building. And I see churches that have finances close. A lot of times before they close, they run out of their finances, but I've seen churches with finances, with financial assets, close. I'd rather have a Chris Callahan than a half million dollars in the bank. Now, a million dollars, no, I'm kidding. <laughs> I'd rather have a Chris Callahan than a half million dollars in the bank, and I'd rather have a Chris Callahan than a building. Because you got Chris, you can have both. You understand what I'm saying? In other words... Uh, realistically, having Chris, you know, we can meet anywhere. We can have a church. But, you know, Chris helped us get a building. Helped us rent a place. I mean, he was a contributing member of the church. And, yeah, he didn't pay for the building. But, he here's what he said in a private conversation with me. He said, if we rent a place, I'll guarantee the rent's paid. In other words, if there's not enough money in the bank, I'll pay it myself. There ain't enough money. If enough money doesn't come in through the tithes and offerings that are given in church, I'll pay for it. He never had to do that. He never had to say, well, Chris, we don't have money in the bank. Can you write a check? But uh, he would have. No question about that at all. He was single. His one purpose in life was that he wanted to be part of a church plant, and he gave himself to it. How much is that worth? Oh, no price. Is it worth a million bucks? It's worth everything, right? Uh, people are a church's greatest asset. Uh, the same is true with you. Now, let me ask you the second question this evening. Um, if people are the church's greatest asset, and they are, they are, is every person worth the same in value I'm not talking about to God or the, the gift of salvation, what God would do for you and what God's invested in you. I believe Jesus would go to, to the cross for any single one of you. And that's how much worth you have in God's eyes. It's infinite value there. I'm talking about the assets of a church. I'm not talking about a financial perspective because financial really isn't an asset. It, uh, people are church's asset. Are some people in the church more valuable than others as an asset? Yes. I would say. Anybody want to disagree with that? I would say no. No? Some people aren't more valuable? Okay, pick your church members. You're going to get to start a church, and you can take any five from our church. You think you may select ones that show up on Sunday night and Wednesday night over those that attend occasionally? Sure. 
Um, <laughs> if you were allowed, uh, would you be interested in how much different individuals are involved in ministry? For instance, if you could take any of my church members, they're not mine, they don't belong to me, but they, this is the way Paul was speaking about his, his children in the Lord. If you could take any of my church members, how valuable would Brother Lee be? Does our junior church, does all of our website, our data, he's our church's secretary, uh, he attends all the services and his whole family does with him, and he moved here just to be part of the church, so he's high commitment level. Uh, in other words, if you got to start a church and you got to pick somebody from our church to take with you to start the church, Are all things being equal, all things aren't equal, are they? I'd be not terribly thrilled about you taking Brother Lee. I wasn't terribly thrilled about Brother Alex leaving. I'm still not thrilled about Brother Alex. I'm still ticked off about Alex leaving. <laughs> Lee's more ticked off than I am about Alex leaving. Tell us about Alex. <laughs> well, later. Yeah. I'm going to get you back. Yeah. Yeah. We want Alex back. <laughs> Alex, you better come back soon. And bring your wife and your son and your dog and whatever else you want to. <laughs> okay. All right. uh, anyway, uh, the reality of it is, is that when it comes to ministry, Ministry leadership, especially ones that just have an overall picture of things, leadership realizes the importance of people. You'd be nuts not to. You can have a church all you want to, but if no one will show up, it isn't much of a church. Right? I mean, okay, there are a couple guys on Facebook that Facebook live their services. And, you know, they're my Facebook friends, and so it pops up. You know, this person's having a service right now. And there's a picture of a pulpit, you know, and like a you know elaborate background or whatever. And there's that person on Facebook preaching to a non-existent congregation of people. And I mean, there are, there are a lot of these, a lot of them. There are a lot of people. Their church closed. People people won't come here and preach, so they have their Facebook church with whoever will check in live. And I'm not trying to be mean spirit or anything like that, but people are pretty important to the church. And Paul has just finished a discourse in 1 Corinthians, getting back to our text, dealing with the problem created by some people saying, I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Christ, and it's caused division in the church. One of the things that's come full circle for Paul is that if he doesn't have the people, he doesn't have a ministry. In other words, if the church at Corinth rejects his apostleship, his calling, was he, was he legitimately called? As an apostle, did, was, uh, this, uh, this is a lollipop question. Was he legitimately called as an apostle? I mean, a bright light from heaven blinds him, and a voice from heaven says, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? And then God tells Cornelius? Who's the guy? Ananias. I always mess Ananias. I'm Cornelius and Ananias are different names, but they're the same in my mind, just like Jeff and Greg, and I have a few other ones like that. Uh, you tell me your name's Jeff, and I don't know if it's Greg or Jeff, or uh, it's just Jeff's and Greg's mix in my brain. It's just one of those things. And Cornelius and Ananias are the same thing. So Cornelius and Ananias uh, <laughs> was uh, told by God that Paul was called to be an apostle, specifically to the Gentiles and the kings. And so was Paul legitimately called? Yeah. Yes, he was. If the people that Paul won to the Lord, specifically these individuals at Corinth, reject him as an apostle, how effective is his ministry? Not very effective. And here Paul is trying to tell them, he's trying to warn them about the importance of acknowledging him as their apostle. Now you say, Pastor, this seems self-centered of Paul. It seems like Paul needs uh, the people. Well, it is true that Paul needed the people, but if he's the legitimate apostle and they're not following him, they've got a problem, don't they? In other words, if God gave Paul to the church at Corinth and they reject Paul, they have a problem, 
don't they? Mm-hmm. Like, how can you have God tell you anything when He's telling you through Paul and you don't listen to Paul? It's important. And Paul sees and understands this. He also understands the value of his ministry. In other words, he thinks highly of the privilege of being an apostle. Paul labored more than all the other apostles because he understood how undeserving he actually was of the title. And it meant the world to him. All that aside, you know, we tend to think, well, you know, Paul, you know, he just, you know, he's trying a little too hard to defend himself. Trying a little too hard to uh, support his ministry. And, you know, he's a little too worried about losing people uh, to false teachers to, or to other teachers. And that isn't the case at all, actually. If you did a job for me of shepherding, let's not do shepherding, okay? Because y'all don't really understand sheep. I know you've read the little books about sheep, but the people that write the books about sheep interview people that actually don't know and believe them, and then those people snicker at them when they read what they write about it because of the silly things they tell them about sheep. You know, for instance, you ever heard this one? If sheep, if a sheep walks off a cliff and they're all in a straight line, another sheep will follow him and just walk off the cliff like a bunch of dumb lemmings and so forth. That isn't true. But somebody thought it was funny to tell somebody researching sheep that so that they could make some great sermon illustration. And <laughs> they put a roadblock in front of lemmings and they turn back and go the other way. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> but the reality is that just isn't true. That isn't true of sheep. But we don't know that much about them. But chickens are, are all the rage right now. People have chickens uh, in their yard. And matter of fact, South Florida, there are chicken neighborhoods. Like if we go over to um, our place on City, Ariel, you need a chicken, don't you? You know, you, you could have a chicken, and if, and if it gave problems, you could just eat it. <laughs> and it would be gone. And they're great it's pets. Just eat it. Yeah. So they are, anyway, they're chickens. I, I'm surprised at how many people are raising chickens in, in cities now. That It's much, much better to get eggs that come from bugs instead of from chicken feed. So uh, the, the free range thing and all that. But here's the funny thing that cracks me up. Whenever people start raising chickens, what kills me about it is something that I found out when I was a kid and we had about 100 chickens, is that chickens are really, really tough to keep alive. They get stolen by things. Raccoons? I mean, raccoons are in Oakland Park a lot. If you have chickens... We're killing raccoons. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, if you have chickens, you will have to get rid of the raccoons that are around you. You know, peaceably um, discourse with them until they stop killing your chickens or whatever you do. Okay, so raccoons will get them. Hawks will get chickens. Brother Al was telling me the other day that about a rooster of his that defended the chick, the hens from a hawk that was swooping down trying to get them. But hawks will make your chickens disappear. Snakes will get your chickens. Um, there's just all kinds of things that will get your chickens. And then, of course, there are chicken thieves. Not the not, not animal kind that will get your chickens. So, <laughs> all right. If I had chickens that I carefully raised in my yard, tended to, and kept alive, which is a lot of work, you know, you really you, you have to build a coop. And if you let them out, you can't just free range them. They'll, get, they'll disappear. Something will take them. Uh, and so you have to watch them. And then you get fun. I mean, you spend time with the chickens and you, you start thinking they're pets. And uh, you, you get attached to them. So if I'm going to be gone for a day and I say, hey, would you mind watching my chickens for me? And you lost a couple of them. You could say, well, I didn't lose them. They were taken by a hawk or by a raccoon or by a chicken thief. I don't care. I didn't want my chickens to be stolen. Do you understand where I'm coming from here? In other words, I gave you those chickens to watch, and if I wanted somebody else to watch them, or if I thought you wouldn't do the job, I'd have called somebody else to watch them. Try it with your kids sometime. Babysit them. Oh, lost them. You know? <laughs> Try it sometime. Well, you know, he's just oversensitive about his kids. He just thinks it's going to be all about him and him keeping his kids. His whole life just got to have his kids. And try that sometime. Yeah. See, God gave Paul a special call, and he had a responsibility to the people 
that he ministered to, and inherent in that responsibility was his job to not lose them. Wasn't supposed to lose them. And yet, for some reason, we have this irrational conclusion that Paul's all about himself. Now he just he's just all about being big shot apostle and having everybody follow him and not reject him. Now he just takes his job seriously. He doesn't want to lose people to false doctrine, to false teachers, and have them become shipwrecked. I promise you, if I had chickens, they'd rather I kept them than let a hawk get them. Or than let a chicken thief get them. Chicken thieves don't steal chickens so they can pet them. They steal them so they can eat them. Just in case you didn't know that. Uh, if you were a chicken, you'd rather have the person who cares about you staying alive watching for you. Okay, now, having said all that, let's, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 4, and let's look at, at Paul's kind of his uh, crowning conclusion. In verse 15, he said, For though ye have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have ye not many fathers. For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Now, ever so occasionally, and actually pretty often, my wife will tell you, I get roped into doing something that I just don't care to do, uh, and that I wouldn't do for myself, but I'll do for somebody else. I have somebody right now trying to get me to go mow someone's grass on Friday. They want me to go mow someone's grass and help mow someone's grass, and I'm, I, I'm tempted to do it, uh, but I don't want to at all. And if I do it, it'll be um, for reasons other than it's for my benefit. It's not for my benefit to do it, obviously, and take away from my time and our time as a church and so forth. Uh, Anthony can't do it. He's got to go to school. Uh, anyway. I'm always doing things that I don't want to do, but if you ask me to babysit your chickens, I'm just going to just straight up tell you, I don't want to watch your chickens. I'm overqualified. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, oh. I, if you ask me to watch your chickens and you talk me into it, it won't be done with love. I mean, I probably know as much about chickens as the. I'm probably in the 90 percentile. I grew up on a farm, and we had a lot of chickens killed, so I know a lot about how they get killed. So, <laughs> I, I probably know more about chickens than most people. But if you get me to babysit your chickens, it will not be a labor of love. I promise you. If I do it, it will be for an ulterior motive. Now, I'm not going to eat your chickens. I'm just saying, if you get me to... I mean, I might if you give me permission, but I, if I watch your chickens for you, it will not be because I care about your chickens. It will be because I care about you, or because you paid me an astronomical amount of money to do it, or whatever, but I will be a hireling for certain when it comes to it. I will not die for, my, for the chickens. My brother the other day told me something that's alarming to me. This, this really isn't funny. The, the, the lady in South Carolina that was eaten the other day by the alligator because she tried to save her dog, oh, yeah. oh. you know, I worry about my brother because he likes his dog too much. And he had his dog swimming in Key Largo in the swimming area. There was a, like a swim area. And then the next day he videoed a 10-foot crocodile swimming in that area. <laughs> and <laughs> his, his dog is, you know, he's dingy and they're just like going up to the crocodile. And, and I asked him, I said, what would you do if the dog, if the crocodile grabbed your dog? And, and you know, I know he'd try to save his stupid dog. I, did I call his dog stupid? Yes. <laughs> what I mean by that is his dog, which is not worth his, the, the, his dog isn't worth what he's worth. Okay. If you had me watch the dog and the crocodile got it, I'd feel dog. really bad and have a hard time telling you what happened. <laughs> I'd be like, I'm having a hard time telling you what happened. Crocodile got your dog. I'm really sorry. I'd be a hireling. You understand what I'm saying? Those I have no. I mean, I like the dog, but I don't love it. And I'm sure not going to get eaten by a crocodile. I might shoot a crocodile if the opportunity's there. You know, I might do something that's within Reason. my personal safety. You know, <laughs> if, I might hit the crocodile with a long stick, but I am not going to try to pull the dog out of his mouth. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, I'm not the guy you want to watch your dog. <laughs>
<laughs> a dog's an animal. What's that? Where about my bunny? Oh, don't trust me with your bunny. <laughs> I've eaten a lot of rabbit and it's good. <laughs> so just don't even try. Okay. So you you guys get the point. In other words, if I'm like, hey, let me watch the dog. Hey, let me watch the dog. Listen, there's an ulterior motive here. It's not like Pastor wants to hang out with the dog and he just loves it so much. He will guard it with his life. No, I might be able to sell it to somebody. Here. <laughs> you know, I might. You know, there's something behind it. Okay. Listen to me now. <clears throat> the people that are trying to get the valuable members of the church at Corinth to follow them instead of Paul didn't love them the way Paul did. And they certainly had an ulterior motive to trying to get those people to follow them. And I'll tell you why. It's because they were an asset. Let me help you with something else. A pet is not a valuable asset, even if it's worth a lot of money, is it? You could offer my brother $100,000 for his dog. I keep using this. But you could offer my brother $100,000 for his dog. I didn't say stupid dog, for his dog that a lot of people like. And he wouldn't sell it to you. Because he thinks it's a human or something. He thinks it's part of the family. You know, he loves it. So he wouldn't sell it. But you could offer me $100,000 for his dog, and I'll steal it for you. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good dog, though. He is a good dog. He, he, there are probably people that would pay that for that dog. He's a good dog. And, I, and if you offer it to me, I'll steal him for you. <laughs> Just don't tell anybody. And delete this video. <laughs> Do you understand what I'm saying? In other words, if somebody's trying to get you as a church member away from your church, don't be so naive as to think you're not an asset. You are, actually. Some more valuable than others, but you know every believer, every member of a church is an asset in the eyes of other people. I guard you against charlatans on a continual basis. I guard you against charlatans. There are people that call, Pastor, I wonder if I could come and present my ministry to your church. What they're saying is I'd like to come and steal some of your people's support so they support me instead of that ministry. Mm -hmm. And I'm not just guarding the church that I'm a member of from that. I'm guarding you from them. Because they're not your fathers in the faith and they're not concerned with your well-being. They're concerned with how much you can give them or whether or not you can perform, provide a service for them. When an insurance salesman calls and says, I'd like to come and talk to your people about how important it is to have a plan in the inevitable event of death. Well, that's very nice and considerate of them to want to make sure that you have a plan for life insurance and so forth. But you know, they're just really looking for a contact list from me. And that's what you are. You're an asset. And they'll give me a deal. I can get free life insurance or 50% off or whatever if I let you come. Um... Amsoil or not, and what's Amway and all of its all of its you know the pyramid groups all those things same way pastor if you let us come and present this in your Sunday school class we'll help your people and it'll help your uh, offerings uh, here's one the money that you need in your ministry is in your church your people have it and we'll come and help you to get them to give and for only ten percent we will you know. No, our people are an asset to you and you're trying to figure out how to get 10% of what they're going to give to the Lord. It's an asset. And Paul said in 1 Corinthians chapter 4, he said, though you have many teachers or 10,000 instructors in Christ, you ever just try to count 1 to 10,000? No. 1, 2, let's do it. We'll, we'll end the service <laughs> when we're done. Okay? It's a lot of counting, isn't it? And this is not just an exaggeration. Paul is saying this is, these are how many people would like to get you to follow them because you're an asset. You have this many people that would like to be your, would be your instructor, not your parent, your instructor. 
They want to tell you what to do for them. Though you have 10,000 instructors in Christ, yet have you not many fathers? For in Christ Jesus I have begotten you through the gospel. Paul said, I want you to remember how you came to Jesus. How'd you come to Jesus? I have begotten you in the gospel. Have you ever had somebody say something like, I've had people say this, Pastor Price saved me. Now that's not literally true. I didn't. And we're talking about spiritually about being born again. And what they're saying is that you know I was the one that shared the gospel with them when they received Jesus as their Savior. So Jesus saved them. I was just the one that God used. But I am their father in the faith. I am the one that brought them to Jesus Christ. Was that to their benefit? Yeah. Yes. Was it to mine? Yeah. Yeah. To some degree. And you know, there are so many people, though, that are like, oh, there's a newly saved person. Let's get them. They're just ready to grab them, snatch them. You need to come to our ministry. You need to be part of this. You need to be part of There's just all kinds of snatch them kind of ministries, grabbing people and getting them in their ministries. And sometimes it feels as though you're like, don't be part of that ministry. and almost feels like, well, you're competing for an asset. But that isn't how a father is, is it? Actually. I remember when I was a teenager, my brother and I could perform a pretty good man's day of work, and we could actually run my dad's salvage yard and run his car crushing uh, operation. And uh, my dad said, you know, these boys are just about out of the house. We need to start another litter. You know, we need to get some more. You know, like, you know, kids are an asset. Like, you know, let's get some kids so they can work. By the way, it's a good idea have a lot of kids so they can do all the work around the house. It's People think, well, you got all those kids, it's so much work. No, you got all those kids, there's so many workers. That's the way, if you raise them right, that's the way it should be. Uh, but no parent that has 10 kids, or no decent parent that has 10 kids, have the kids so they can work for them. You understand? In other words, you'd say, oh, I could tell Lee, I'd say, hey, Lee, why don't you just give me Luke for a year? And he's like, well, you know, yeah, look at Luke. Yeah, well, no, you wouldn't like it. <laughs> My dad's a nice guy. I didn't realize how nice he was. Uh, but uh, hey, you know, give me Luke for the. I'd take Luke for a year. I'd take Shamir. I'd take all these teenagers. I, Eric, yeah, I'd take him. Yeah. Take him. Okay. <laughs> all right. I'd take him. I'll tell you what, these teenagers on church work day, I can get some work done around here with these teenagers we've got right now. We can get some serious work done. They're profitable. I mean, they're just, they're solid. Lee would not give me Luke. And Tashi probably wouldn't give me Ariel most days. Uh, and I'll tell you why. It's not because, I mean, Luke is an asset, isn't he? He's a help. Sunday's on the way down. He watches Caleb on the bus. You know, and he helps take care of the kids. He has chores around the house. He cuts the lawn every couple months or so. And he does some things that are valuable. Lee... If you lost your son, would it be what he does for you that you'd be concerned about? No. What, what's the most valuable thing to him about, to you? What's the most valuable thing about him to you? But he's my son. He's your son. Is he an asset? Yeah. He is. He is an asset. I mean, he's a contributing riffle. More so every day. He's really becoming a great man. Really is, and uh, I'll take him if you want to get rid of him. I'll just, I'll, I'll take him, and I'll even, I'll even do some of the feeding part. You gotta get some of your own food. <laughs> I, I, you, it's hard to fuel them when they're that size. Uh, but <laughs> the, the reality of it is, is I'll take him. He's not gonna give up his son. Is it because you know he doesn't want to cut the grass himself? Well, that's a consideration. <laughs> But the real deal is, is that it's his son. He cares about him. And here Paul differentiates the ministry that he has with the people at Corinth and the 10,000 instructors that they have. He's like a father to them. The rest of them are like people that can get something from them. And that's a big difference. Now let me just give you some marks in context. Maybe just one, maybe two. Marks that distinguish or differentiate between, uh, between a minister who 
considers you an asset and one who considers himself your father or loves you. Because that's really the difference, isn't it? If you were to say, what would be the difference between Paul being their father and these instructors that are trying to get them to not follow Paul and follow them instead? The difference is Paul loves them. That's the big difference. Well, go to verse uh, 18. Now, some of you are puffed up as though I would not come to you, but I will come to you shortly if the Lord will, and will know not the speech of them which are puffed up, but the power. Here's a yes or no question. Is this a threat? Some of y'all pretty big stuff in a letter. When I come, we're going to find out how big you are. That's a threat. That's a threat, isn't it? Mm -hmm. All right, is Paul being um, diplomatic here? No. He's being direct, isn't he? You are very, very close to having some real and actual consequences, is what he just said. In other words, <laughs> we have a really good understanding of this in our generation. We know what a keyboard jockey is, right? The guy that sits at home in his sweatpants and talks tough on the keyboard <laughs> in the basement of his mother's house or whatever. Oh, you know? <laughs> but knock on the door one time. I heard what you said about me. What's that? They're called social uh, justice warriors. Social justice warriors. I like keyboard jockey, but I thank you for the term. You know, in other words, they're a tough guy on a keyboard. But in person, they're not so tough. And that's what Paul is saying here. Is that a threat? Is it a threat? Is Paul threatening here? Is he saying, hey, I'm going to come meet the keyboard jockeys, and we're going to have a face-to-face -face discussion? I don't know. The sports one always, always, um, always uh, cracks me up. You ever watch a sports uh, commentator? And they'll call a guy soft or a sissy or whatever. You know, the guys they're calling soft are like seven foot tall and they can bench press like 450 pounds. <laughs> and, you know, and they'll be like, oh, man, he's so soft. Not he's, Kevin Durant. Like, for instance, uh, Hassan Whiteside. How tall is the guy? At least seven. He's 7'3 seven, or 7'3 ish, somewhere in there, seven foot three. And right now he's like one of the softest basketball players there is. I dare you walk up to him and just be like, man, you're such a sissy. He's soft. <laughs> dare you. I did on Instagram. <laughs> <laughs> in other words, they're all calling him out. I'm calling you out. No, they're not. They're not calling him. I'm calling you out. You're soft. All these commentators are calling him out. Calling him out is like, come outside. I'm outside. Come out here. Yeah. I think I'd do that. <laughs> um, one, of, one of the commentators called out Chris Bosh when uh, Miami Heat had the big three. Uh, LeBron James, Dwayne Wade, and Chris Bosh. I can't remember who it was, but one of the guys is pretty well known. And he called him soft. And then Chris Bosch came on his show. I don't think you're soft anymore. You know, what I meant by that was... You know what I'm saying? Paul is here saying, I'm going to come over there. If the Lord will, and I think He will, I'm coming. Okay, and then he said in chapter 5, verse 1, now he just moves on. Here's what we're we'll talking about. It's reported commonly among you that there's, or that there's fornication among you and such as is not named among the Gentiles. And so now he begins to talk about what the things are that he's going to talk to them about. First of all, he wants them to know, yes, you may be an asset, but that's not my focus on you. I'm a father. And you know, there's nobody that gets serious about problems with the kids like Dad does. Listen to me. A mark of someone who's a father is somebody who just won't just tell you how great you are all the time. Sometimes he'll tell you what your problems are, and he'll say, I'm going to do something about that, too. That's a mark of somebody that loves you. Somebody else will be like, well, you know, I don't know, I don't know why, you know, he just gets so upset at you. He just needs to see the good in you. You know, a father can see the good in his kids, but he can oftentimes see it being completely compromised by the evil. And so the evil is what he's got to deal with. You know, you don't want to be in a church where somebody only sees the good in you. Do you? That's, that's just a church where they say, well, you know, I, I can get something from them. Versus, you know what, we've got to make sure for everything they can be. And uh, you know what, we're up on time this evening. We went a little longer, I guess, fooled around a little bit more than we should have.
But you see Paul's focus here this evening? You see what a real church ought to be, a real ministry ought to be? It doesn't have somebody that sees the greatest asset of the church is only an asset. It sees you as valuable, but you're valuable for a different reason. You're valuable not just because of what you can give or what you can do. You're valuable because of who you are in that relationship. I hadn't said this, but I will. I hadn't gotten to this, and I don't want to keep adding things. That's why a lot of pastors don't last very long in churches. Because they see the people all wrong. When somebody opposes them or makes things hard for them or uh, gives them a tough time about something, they see them as an enemy. They'll push people out of the church, and sometimes it comes to a head. Man, I'll tell you what, I hear from guys who say, man, brother, you just would not believe the things that people in my church say or the things that people in my church do. I would, you know. And I also believe the things that you say or do are the way they feel about you. You know, I found out when people know you love them, they don't always respond right away, but they usually respond to that. They just, I mean, it's, they don't. sometimes they get angry. Most of the time they get angry. They, they respond wrong at first. But when they know you love them, when they know you're still going to be there and you don't just view them as an asset, they'll come around if they know it. The same is true with parents. You know, Pastor Price will probably be way cooler the first day than Brother Lee. But Pastor can't love Luke like a son the way Lee can love Luke like his son. And there's just never be a replacement for that. There'll never be a substitution for that. And so that's the way we need to see things in the ministry. We need to see our people. When you see people being drawn out of the church, and don't think, oh, we're losing an asset. But think, somebody's trying to steal them. Our people. How do you feel about it when somebody steals our people with false doctrine or with things that to attract them that aren't the right things. How do you feel about it? And I feel like, you know, you're not going to just steal our people. Try to contend for it. Try to fight for them. No self-respecting chicken farmer would do otherwise. I mean pastor would do otherwise. Okay. Father, thank you for what you taught us this evening. I pray that you would help us. Help us to remember it, to, to absorb it, and by the help of your Spirit, God, to really have a good focus and understanding as a church. Lord, I pray it would just be from all the different perspectives where we would learn to value the thing that's valuable. And here we see Paul not just simply uh, trying to get something, but we see the, the heart that he has and the value that he has for these people, why it's so personal for him that they grow and that they do right. It's because he sees them as his spiritual children. Lord, I pray that you'd help us to love people the same way and invest in them the same way we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.